Okay, so what I want to do is give you a little bit of more background on just mixed methods designs in general uh, and reflect a bit on what we've seen in the last couple of days. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm going to come back to this point that I've been making a lot since day one, which is the reason why we're doing, the reason why I personally am insisting that you think of mixed methods research design, um, and I stand by this in general, is that I really do believe that it leads to, you know, stronger studies, better papers, uh, better everything in the end, because all of these methods that I've tried to convince you, and I'm sure you'll see as we uh, continue with the semester, they, they all have their, you know, unique strengths and weaknesses, and really uh, a cheap way, relatively, of uh, overcoming some of these limitations uh, is by thinking of these multi-methodology mixed methods designs. Uh, th th to me, that seems like it's an obvious cheap way to uh, to strengthen your studies. Uh, okay, so that's why we're doing this. One small pedantic point you might see people uh, you know, being pedantic about this. I'm, I'm not, but just so you've heard this at least once, uh, people uh, talk about mixed methods designs and multi-methodology designs, and they mean different things by the two. So when we say multi-methodology, uh, that means two or more approaches to either data collection or analysis to corroborate, complement, and expand research findings. Uh, when they say mixed methods, they mean more specifically combining and integrating inductive style with deductive style research for some reason. So this is a one one definition of these terms. I, I don't really, I'm not strict with this. I don't really care. Uh, but just so you're aware of this, you know, if you get pedantic reviewers and whatnot, uh, this is something that might come up. Okay. So there's roughly, if you remember the Easterbrook chapter of selecting empirical methods, we read this in the first class. If you remember that, they talk about the three common strategies for mixed methods in our area. The first one, so I'm going to distinguish between sequential things, things that happen in some order, and we've seen lots of examples of that in, in your project proposals, versus concurrent things, things that happen in parallel sort of at the same time. Uh, and there's two flavors of sequential things. I talked a little bit about this on Tuesday. Uh, the first one is sequential explanatory strategy. Uh, so this is where you typically start with some quantitative analysis and you follow that with uh, collecting and analyzing qualitative data. And they call it explanatory because typically you use the qualitative data and analysis to explain things that you've observed in the first part of this uh, quantitatively. So that's one common strategy that you'll see used a lot is, is this, where there's some quantitative collection of data and analysis followed by some qualitative collection of data and analysis, and then interpretation and uh, conclusions at the end. Okay. The other one uh, is called sequential exploratory rather than explanatory. Um, and this is the two methods uh, in the opposite sequence, in the opposite order. So here you start with something qualitative um, and you follow that up with a quantitative data collection and analysis. So one common example, you've seen this a lot in our class uh, is, uh, I don't know, some sort of interviews or something like that to uh, better understand some problem uh, derive hypothesis, whatever, and, and following that up with uh, maybe a larger scale validation with a large survey or maybe with a tool and, and whatnot, so things of that nature. So some so qualitative analysis to better understand something followed up by some uh, further uh, exploration of, of that thing quantitatively, validation at scale and whatnot. Uh, so that's the other one. Uh, and finally, there's the concurrent strategy. So this is not sequential. That's the main contrast here. Uh, concurrent triangulation strategy has to do with uh, using both of these methods concurrently in an attempt to confirm or cross-validate or corroborate or triangulate as in the name uh, the findings that uh, you're getting 
Uh, and the reason for this is, uh, well, for example, that what people say could be very different from what we do. We saw some examples the other day when we talked about you know, biases in surveys and interviews. Uh, so that's one so useful way to uh, understand this difference if, if it's present between what people say and what people do is to try to corroborate what they say with you know, data from a, a different source. Um, and you know, no, notice how that sort of would happen more or less concurrently rather than in sequence. Meaning the analysis, so let me show you this. The analysis of the qualitative data happens in parallel concurrently with the analysis of the quantitative data. Rather than you complete that part of the project entirely before you start collecting the different kind of data and analyzing that. Okay, so that's the main distinction. It's, it's the it's idea that you can feed you know, things that you learn from one side into what you're doing on the other side and vice versa. Rather than, you know, if you do it the other way around sequentially, that part is closed off, right? So you, 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 know, you will have conducted all of your interviews, say, and then you start collecting numerical data and you analyze that. And, you know, maybe you learn something useful from this and you wish you had asked them another question or something, but you're, you can't do that anymore. Or, you know, uh, you know or, or the other way around, right? Maybe, uh, you know, maybe you wish you had collected a different variable to include in your models that comes out of your you know, second round interviews as being really important. But, you know, that ship has sailed, right? You've, you've completed that analysis. So really this is, you know, hopefully you will see a stronger design to the extent that you can, you know, fit your work into this concurrent strategy is usually stronger because it's kind of, you know, helps reinforce each of these things that you do otherwise separately. Uh, so I, I'm going to advocate for this. That makes sense, Jenny. Oh, no. oh okay. All right. Um, so th this is me uh, trying to fit uh, most, I think, of your projects. I may have run out of time at some point and didn't capture quite all of them. But this is me trying to fit everything I've heard over the last couple of days, classes, um, into one of these three things. And you know, um, so I saw a lot of this, I, I saw lots of examples, I think of, of everything. Like if I think of sequential exploratory, qualitative followed by quantitative, you know, Maddie's project, logical restoration started with some interviews, uh, followed by some social network analysis, Courtney's interviews on open source dependency management, interviews followed by survey, uh, Paolo's thing, studying uh, or like interviewing uh, whatever uh, developers, um, and then mining Ross documentation, uh, Kush's and Akita's, uh, maybe uh, maybe a survey of needs that feeds into this you know second round model. I, I think of that as a quantitative analysis. Um, so you know these are maybe sequential exploratory things. You know by all means feel free to object. I could have misinterpreted your your work. So this is not uh, this is just an attempt. It could be flawed. Um, sequential explanatory. This is the other way around. Quant followed by qualitative. Ian's thing. Uh, mining repositories in Rust following up with interviews. Elijah's thing. Mining gender and code following followed by qualitative analysis of of that. Leo and Manisha staying with bots, mining followed by qualitative analysis, Daniel's breaking changes, mining followed by qualitative analysis, Cheng Yang's doing this benchmark evaluation followed by a user study, uh, Vasu's dependency manager, um, similar benchmark evaluation followed by some user study. So these seemed to me like they would fit this mold of uh, quantitative followed by qualitative. Uh, and then I didn't really see too many examples of concurrent uh, things, you know, maybe Sam and Matt's, um, the uh, automatic test generation with Oracle study, uh, because it was this experiment that allowed for you know, both sort of quantitative and qualitative things kind of at the same time. Um, Eli's thing with group biases was also similarly because of an experiment, you know, Jenny's experiment, AB test, uh, the co-pilot with proms seemed like you would fit this. Uh, charities analysis of uh, uh, you know Taiwan flights and whatnot. 
seemed a little bit like it would fit this, right? So there was this correlation statistical analysis between uh, flights and tweets. Uh, and so th that triangulated concurrently with this qualitative analysis of the content of those tweets, you know, something of that nature. And, you know, maybe there were others. So this is sort of kind of how I would map what I have seen so, so far. Uh, so let me know if I, uh, A, if I missed you, and B, if I mischaracterized you uh, in this. The other related thing to this, um, you know, many of your projects had multiple parts to them. So it could be that, you know, if I look at some part of your project, you know, it fit in one of these buckets, but maybe a different part of your project would fit in a different bucket. So it wasn't entirely obvious how to, to map these, um, but this, this was my attempt. Okay. So now let's spend just a few minutes. The reason why, uh, uh, I've done this is because there is this push, at least in the software engineering community, to follow more precisely defined and therefore you know, stricter standards in reviewing papers that conform to various uh, empirical methodologies. Um, and you know, people have even written down standards for you know what must be present in studies that include you know qualitative analysis and whatnot uh, and you could look these up it's quite interesting there's lots of things but just to give you a few examples so these are uh, grouped into you know must-haves and nice-to-haves and kind of optional things and there's a long list of things uh, i won't go over everything you can read this on your own but just i want to give you a few examples so for example you know, you, if you're using a mixed method design, if you're proposing that, you must justify why you're doing this. You must justify what those uh, multiple methodologies, why they're needed. Um, you must explain what their intent is, what they're trying to do, why they must be mixed, right? Um, uh, you must describe what exactly you're doing in each of them. You must describe which phases of the research each of these different methods addresses. And, you know why that's a, what it's needed. Why that's a good idea. Um, you must argue why that method aligns with the particular research question. Um, this one is one that's particularly tricky. This one is the one that gets overlooked a lot. Uh, we're going to talk about anti-pattern if we have time in a minute. Um, but people rarely get a chance to actually integrate the findings from all of the methods to like fully and deeply address the research questions they're proposing. Like much more often than not, um, these things are completely independent parts of a paper. Um, and you know, if I go back to this map I tried to make with sequential versus concurrent, there was a lot in sequential uh, as well, including in your projects, right? So I'm gonna argue that you know, if you can, right, if you can, go one step deeper and try to really fully integrate the things, right? You'll, you'll get more benefit from actually following these mixed methods, methodologies, then, because otherwise it's basically just doing two separate studies that don't really help each other out too much. You know, it's okay, right? It's, it's still, we're learning more than by doing one study, right? You, you're basically doing two studies, we're learning more, it's useful, but it's even more useful, I'm gonna argue, if you really try to, uh, integrate the the two and integrate the findings from the two. Um, right, acknowledge the limitations. Be honest about what things these things uh, uh, can and cannot do, and, and do that in writing. Okay, and then there's a long list of desirable things. Uh, yeah, I I like this one with uh, having a visual diagram uh, uh, representing an overview of your study. It makes it easy for reviewers to kind of understand at a high level. You know what what the methodology is in particular i see complaints yes elijah uh, what do you what do you i am confused as to why defining the multi methodology or mixed methods is under desirable and not essential i think the assumption is that uh, uh reviewers know the definitions they're experts they're subject matter and, and methodology experts so they they don't really need the reviewers don't really need the definition but maybe for a more general audience of readers of the paper it's useful 
Good eye. I'm wondering if these um, new rules are specific to mixed methods research, or if this is just the mixed methods part of a broader rule set. Because to me, it seems like a conflict of interest. Like we want to have people publish less and more and better research, but then the bar for publishing better research is it's got to be absolutely the best, most well thought out mixed methods paper. Like it, to me, it seems like a, a good way of getting around this is publish a bunch of tiny papers with one method. No, so you're right. Uh, the these standards are uh, also for you know, individual methods, not just for mixing methods. Uh, I'm only highlighting the part about mixing methods here because it was relevant to our discussion, but th these are defined much more broadly to, you know, to address all possible scenarios. Yeah. Okay, um, right, let's review. Okay. Yep. Oh, sorry, Sam, yeah. Just kind of following off what Eli was saying, I guess, like, I, I had kind of a similar question of like, this is saying, oh, you know, if you're doing a mixed method study, you should like do this, this, and this, like make sure you explain why these methods are needed and why they're needed together. Like, I'm guessing that they're already similar. Like, is it, are there already similar yes. guidelines? For yes. Single yes. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. So then, okay, so then I guess, yeah, I guess that. Yeah, there, there are already guidelines for individual methods. Uh, studies need not be mixed methods. Like not, not every study is going to be, be mixed methods. I'm not asking for that at all. I'm just, uh, you know, as a general philosophy, I'm advocating that, you know, on average, this probably leads to deeper and more interesting science, but by all means, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, diversity in, in science and research. Uh, and at a different time, something else is more appropriate. So if you, I would never reject papers that are not mixed methods. Speaking of, speaking of rejecting papers, uh, well, actually, let me show you a few anti-patterns first. Um, they've defined a list of anti-patterns that you might see in uh, mixed methods papers. First one, uninvited guest. This is when, um, you know, let's say there's a paper on, I don't know, uh, qualitative study, and in the discussion section, they're like, oh, by the way, we also ran a 10,000 people survey to validate this, kind of in the, in the last page. So it's kind of a, an afterthought. It's not really uh, incorporated in, in anything. Uh, makes an unexpected entrance at the end. Smoke and mirrors, you're overselling a study as a multi-methodology or mixed methods when one approach at best offers a token or anecdotal contribution to the research motivation and findings. Selling your soul when you're employing an additional method only because I asked you to. <laughs> Not you, Paula. <laughs> um, you know, not because it really contributes substantively to the research findings. Uh, integration failure, we talked about this as an anti pattern. Um, and yeah, there's a few more. Yeah, there's a few more. Anyway, so you read this. Uh, let me tell you a couple of invalid criticisms, just so you, you know, you're aware of this. Um, so, for example, if uh, reviewers complain that, you know, oh, you have a, this mixed methods study, but your, uh, you know, you, your interviews only take up one page and your quantitative analysis takes up, you know, the remaining nine pages. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's too, too imbalanced, reject. Right, so no, uh, they need not, uh, they need not contribute equally. They just need contribute something that, you know, is, is useful. It does not need to be balanced. Uh, the mixed method approach is not necessary, right? A reviewer could argue, yeah, but you didn't have to also do, you know, this interviews. Well, yeah, sure, but you know they're useful. I'm learning something by doing this, so you know you can't uh, you can't reject the paper for doing more than more than it needs to. Um, the methodologies have different philosophical foundations. Like, oh yeah, you're combining interviews with your know, data analysis, uh, quantitative modeling, or something. You can't do that because you know one is deductive, the other one is inductive. That you know is a valid. Sorry, that's an invalid criticism. Uh, right, the wrong method is dominant. This is uh, again about balance, inconsistent findings. Right. So, like, let's say, let's say you your interviewees tell you something, but then when you do a large scale regression model to validate that or something like that, 
you don't find any supporting evidence for whatever you learned uh, in, in your interviews for that particular issue. Um, so there's an inconsistency between what you're finding from the interviews and what you're learning from the data, quantitative data analysis. Uh, that is an invalid reason to reject the paper. It's actually super interesting. To me, those are the most interesting things, right? Because then I, I want to see, you know, I want to see people going into deeper into trying to figure out what went wrong. Is it that, you know, it doesn't hold at scale? Is it that you're not measuring it properly? Is it something else altogether? In any case, it's the most interesting part, I think, of a, you know, of a study. Uh, it's finding these inconsistencies. That, that's why you're triangulating and corroborating in the first place, is to find these, uh, these corner cases. Those are interesting. Okay, so now let me end with this. Um, I'm bringing back the uh, specification for your final projects. Uh, this is just a screenshot from that uh, Google Doc where I describe what must go in the final report at the end of the semester. Uh, and I'm highlighting uh, the parts related to methodology, a detailed description of the overall study design, which methods are used for which parts, how they're mixed, et cetera, detailed description of individual research methods, for example, for a quantitative analysis, what data will be collected, how it will be processed and aggregated, how it will be analyzed, etc. Um, basically, now that you've seen this list of desirable and, and essential and whatever else things in your research designs, and you can follow up with the individual methods list of a checklist of things, um, it would be good if you're able to provide that level of detail. Uh, both I and the reviewers of your future papers on whatever project you're working on will appreciate that level of transparency and rigor and thought that went into your uh, write-ups. So I'm going to end with this uh, and take more questions. Matt. My favorite reviewer feedback is, I know you answered these research questions, but I have this other one that I was <laughs> Yeah. So that was, I believe that was one of the anti-patterns. I don't remember. Um, that is an anti-pattern, right? So um, you cannot fault a paper for that is otherwise valid for being a different paper than you yourself would have written. <laughs> that is not a valid reason to reject the paper. I feel valid. I, I will uh, stand up and champion papers uh, when I see people complaining uh, about this in uh, PC discussions. Okay, very good. So I look forward to seeing you next week. We shall talk about experiment design.